morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am thankful, brothers and sisters, to see you here this morning. I know there are many who are not able to be here, not able to be at worship service. As was mentioned, of course, we've had some in the hospital, some who are in care facilities, and, and they are currently with the current situation in a lockdown. We know that there are others, I'm sure, that perhaps are under the weather or, or whatever the reason may be. We know that there are those who are not here. It is a good thing that we are able to come and to worship the Lord and be able to praise Him, exalt Him, to be able to admonish one another, to be able to edify one another. And brothers and sisters, we all need that strength. We all need that help as we strive to get to heaven. And so it is a joy that we are able to come here and, and to do so. I would ask you to bow with me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, we gather here this morning before you to worship you. Father, we praise and exalt you. We know how wonderful you are, how just and merciful you are. And we are thankful that we are able to gather here this morning, that we are able to worship you. We pray that we may be forgiven of any sins that are in our lives that would hinder our worship of you, Father. We pray that we may set aside the cares of this world and worship you in a pleasing manner. Father, we pray that we may teach and admonish one another this morning, that we may strengthen, that we may build up, edify one another. Father, we are thankful for your word that teaches us in the way that we should go, and we pray that we may strength, be strengthened thereby, that we may encourage one another and teach others as well that they may come to know you before it's everlasting too late. We are mindful of, of many things that are going on in the world today that can be distracting and, and can be worrisome. And we just pray again that we can set those things aside and focus on what we are doing and why we are here, Father. And that we may do all this in a pleasing and acceptable manner, Father. It is in Christ's most precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. We, brothers and sisters, are led by the Spirit. Now, many within Christian Christendom, if they are were here, or if they watch via the internet, would probably be shocked to hear me say that. Some within the Brotherhood may likewise be surprised. You see, many within Christendom think that we reject the Holy Spirit. They they believe that we reject his work, his, his, his act, act, activity within our lives. Many within the church <coughs> will grab a hold of what the, the religious world, what Christendom does, and they say, and, and I've said this on, in relation to many different ideas, that we find many within the brotherhood who will hear some in the denominational world go to a point that the Bible does not support, and then they will, in an effort to refute that, I submit to you they swing way back over to the other side, and they get off in the other way. As a matter of fact, brothers and sisters, I'm guessing there are those who perhaps would hear this lesson who might be ready to label me by saying that, that they might be ready to label me a false teacher. You see, what they do, what many people do, is they equate the Holy Spirit with the miraculous. They equate the work of the Holy Spirit, the leading of the Holy Spirit, as miraculous, which, by the way, is exactly what the, the Christendom, what, what the religious world as a whole does, and then they point out, rightly so, I might add, 1 Corinthians 13, that the miraculous has ceased. And therefore their argument goes like this. Since it is miraculous, and the miraculous has ceased, the work of the Holy Spirit has ceased, the involvement, maybe I should put it more so that way, that the involvement of the Holy Spirit is 
has ceased. So that the Holy Spirit does not lead us. Not everyone holds that view, by the way, but some probably do. The truth of the matter, though, is that they are both wrong. He does lead us, and the Bible teaches, it, teaches us that. The question must be asked, though, and, and here's where we want to be clear about, and I want to, to, to clear all of this up and make sure that we understand of what we are saying, that, that the real question that comes to mind is how does he lead us? There is the matter. I can't see that, Jim. 642. 642, okay. <clears throat> but the, the, the real question is how? How does he lead us? And there's where we want to get to this morning because how we answer that question will, will make a difference as to whether we are in fact teaching error or we are not. You see, brothers and sisters, the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit leads. We see certainly in Matthew chapter 4, Verses 1 and following, we see that the Holy Spirit led Christ. We read here, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So we see there in, in chapter 4 and verse 1 of, of Matthew, and of course you can read the, the remainder down through verse 11 and see how he was tempted, but we see the Holy Spirit led him up into the wilderness. We see this activity and, and it was not simply Christ that was being led. We see his apostles and others during the first century that in fact that in fact led, were led by the Spirit. We look in the book of Acts chapter 8. We see in verse 29, Acts chapter 8 and, and verse 29 we see that the Holy Spirit is leading. <clears throat> Acts chapter 8 and verse 29 we read, Then Excuse me, I was in chapter 7. I was looking at it. I'm like, well, that's not the text we're looking for. But chapter 8 and verse 29, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to the chariot. Of course, talking here, what we see in context, and we'll get back to this in a few moments, what we see is the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch and how Philip is being led, he is being instructed, told by the Spirit to go near and join himself to the chariot, to get in the chariot. And of course he was to teach the Ethiopian eunuch. We turn over to chapter 10, verses 19 and 20 of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So we see here Peter being spoken to by the Holy Spirit, being instructed by the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 2, Acts chapter 13 and verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, we might say, said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. So we see the, the involvement of the Holy Spirit here. And of course we could go on into other chapters. We see in Acts chapter 15 that the Holy Spirit was involved in, in this Jerusalem conference. So we see the Holy Spirit actively involved in doing things. Now, one might, and rightly so, point out that, Robert, that was then. That was, that was he led Christ, uh, that was when Christ was here on earth. He, he, he led Peter, and he led Philip, and he led others, and, and, and uh, selected Paul and Barnabas. He was involved in the Jerusalem conference, that was all during the first century, and he no longer does those things. Brothers and sisters, to an, to an extent, I say amen. That's true. He doesn't do those things. And we're going to get into that again in a few moments as we go through our lesson. But does he, in fact, is he involved with the Christian today? Now, I want to, I want to very limitedly Focus on that question. Is he involved? We'll get to how in a minute. But 
Is he involved in the Christian's life today? The answer is undoubtedly yes. We notice in some texts, Acts chapter 8, or excuse me, Romans chapter 8, and we'll begin with verse 8. And I would encourage you to read the entire chapter here, but I want to begin, for time's sake, we'll begin with verse 8 of Romans chapter 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Brothers and sisters, I submit to you that if we are not led by the Spirit, then we are not sons of God. You can't. I mean, that's what Paul is saying there, is it not? That if we are led by the Spirit, then we are sons of God. Now, some might say, well, Paul's talking about miraculous things those things have ceased, 1 Corinthians 13. That's what he's talking about. Brothers and sisters, I submit to you that, that the question again is not whether he leads us. It, it, he does lead us. And these texts, and, and we see in various texts that, that he does, in fact, lead us. In Galatians chapter 5, in Galatians chapter 5, again, Paul here is writing in verses 16 through 18, Galatians 5, verses 16 through 18. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and there are, and these are contrary to the, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. sisters, we see in these various texts, we see that we are led by the Spirit. I want us to consider, we look in, in the book of John, and we see the Holy Spirit referred to as the Comforter. Jesus in chapters 14, 15, and 16 of John, in, in that discussion there, in that presentation there, Jesus is talking and he repeatedly comes back to this idea, telling his apostles, telling his disciples that he is going to send the Comforter. He's going to go away. He's, he's preparing them. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be put to death. He's going to return to the Father. And yet he is not going to leave, leave them comfortless. He is going to send. He's going to send the Spirit. I want to notice in verse 13, and, and we're kind of jumping back here, but purposely so here, because, because it's going to lead us into our question of how he leads us. In, in verse 13, Jesus says in, in John 16, verse 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, and again the Spirit of truth here, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit is, is who he's talking about, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So, this leads us to the question of how that he leads us. We see that he led them in the first century, he led Jesus up to the wilderness to be tempted. And we see that he led led various ones to write the, the scriptures, that he inspired them 
to in fact care to write these these things. We know uh, that the Bible teaches us these things. We see in in First Corinthians, excuse me, Second Peter chapter one and verse twenty one. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were what moved by the Holy Ghost. So he, we see his his actively being involved that, that throughout time, at different times, he has actively been involved in inspiring individuals to write what we now have, the, the Scripture. There were about 40, give or take, 40 people who wrote the Bible. Again, I say give or take because there are some that we aren't quite sure, that we really don't know, as to who exactly wrote it. And depending on who wrote it, varies the number a little bit. But about 40 authors, 40 people. But ultimately, we see, as Peter is here writing, that we see that the ultimate author, the ultimate writer of the Scriptures, is the Spirit of God. It is God who wrote the Bible. And we need to understand that. And it is important for us. How does He guide us? And, and to answer this question, we're going to answer it in some different ways aspects of our lives. How does it guide us in relation to salvation? There are those who argue that he does so miraculously. They say that you can't be saved until the Spirit comes upon you, acts upon you, and changes your sinful heart to the point where you can in fact be saved. When it comes to salvation, it is only through miraculous intervention by the Holy Spirit, they say, and this is what they say, that, that you can be saved. The Bible, though, does not teach that. Nowhere do we see the Bible teaching that. We mentioned, of course, and we looked in, in Acts chapter 8 and, and verse 29. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 29, we noticed, of course, how that Philip was told to go. We read here, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Now, and someone might grab a hold of that and say, you see there, Robert, the Holy Spirit is actively, miraculously involved in it. But notice who the Holy Spirit is talking to. Is he talking to Philip the preacher or is he talking to the one who's about to be converted to the truth? In fact, he's talking to Philip, the one who is preaching. Isn't he? We, we can back up and we see, of course, in verse 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. So here we find that the angel of the Lord tells Philip to go, tells him where to go. He's speaking to this inspired, keep in mind, Philip is inspired, he is speaking to this inspired individual who has these miraculous abilities laid upon him. We can go back to Acts chapter 6 and see how that Philip was, had, his, had the apostles lay their hands on him and impart upon him the, the miraculous abilities. And here the, the angel of the Lord appears to him, talks to him. Then the Spirit comes to him and tells him to go and join himself to the chariot. But notice... After this, brothers and sisters, verse 30 and, and following, verse 30 and following, and Philip ran thither, Philip, who's just been told by the Spirit to go near and join himself to this chariot, and Philip ran thither to him and heard him, the Ethiopian eunuch here, read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I? Except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his, humili in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet? 
this of himself, uh, speak at the prophet this, of himself or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So we see here that he goes up, he, he, he follows the instructions, Philip does, the instructions of the Holy Spirit. He goes, he, he interacts with this Ethiopian eunuch who is reading Isaiah, and, and by the way, Isaiah 53, uh, specifically there, uh, verse 7 and, and all, and, and reading there about the, the, the sacrifice of, of Christ. And we often read that in relation to the Lord's Supper, memorial uh, for his sacrifice. But, but he's reading this, and, and Philip asks him, does he understand what he's reading? How could I? Let some man teach me. And then he asks that question, well, who's he talking about? And, and I just love this text, brothers and sisters. He tells him, and we, we are told that he began at that scripture, there in verse 35, he began at that scripture and he preached unto him Jesus. He preached, brothers and sisters. And keep that word in, in your thoughts. Keep them in mind. Keep it in mind because he preached to the Ethiopian unit. He preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water and the unit said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? By the way, Isaiah 53 says nothing about baptism. And yet somewhere in preaching Jesus, he talked about baptism. He talked about what needed to be done because the Ethiopian unit got it from somewhere and didn't get it from reading Isaiah 53, even if he could have understood it. You don't get it from Isaiah 53 because it's not there. But he asked, you know, here's water, what does Henry need to be what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So we see here how that this Ethiopian eunuch is converted to Christ, is converted to the truth. We must realize and how it is, in fact, the Spirit led this individual, not by coming and acting upon his heart to convince him to be saved, but by what? By preaching. By the preaching of the gospel, I might add, as we'll get into in a few moments. We see in Acts chapter 16 the conversion of Lydia. A seller of purple, as we read there in Acts 16, beginning with verse 14. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and into my house and abide there and she constrained us. Now, someone might read that and say, you see there, whose heart the Lord opened. And how is it that he opened? Notice the next phrase, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Brothers and sisters, she had her, her heart open. She had her mind guided. She was taught what she needed to do to be saved the same way everyone else is, through the Word. Now, we understand that there were those who were inspired, Paul, Philip, others, who, who preached by miraculous abilities because they did not have the completed written Word of God. Brothers and sisters, we understand when that which is, come, which is perfect has come, 1 Corinthians 13, we read about it. When that which is perfect, the, the completed written word of God has come, then that which is in part, these miraculous abilities, that is the context, the discussion of, of the, the text there in, in chapters 12, 13, and 14, when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. That which is perfect has come, brothers and sisters. We have the written word of God, and it guides us in the way that we are to be saved. Remember, 
what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. He saves through preaching. Keep in mind what, what he wrote in Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, Paul lays out very plainly what we need to know about the process, the, the way that we are saved. And, and he kind of does it. He does it back in the way he does. We're going to back up and we're going to start with verse 9 here of, of Romans 10. And we read, But if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whoso believeth on him, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Verse 12, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we must call upon the name of the Lord. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not heard? Or excuse me, in whom they have not believed. Okay, so can't call on Him unless you believe first. And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? You can't believe unless you've heard. And how shall they hear without a preacher? You've got to have a preacher. How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. A quote from Isaiah 52 and verse 7. So we see here, the preacher is sent. Now it was done so miraculously, as we read there in, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 29, backing up, verse 26 and following, and we see the miraculous thing, but we need to understand, even in this process, that we are led to go preach by the Spirit through the written Word. Because he tells us to teach his word. He tells us to share the good news. So he, he sends us the Christian. He tells the Christian to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We have the obligation to share the good news with others. So the preacher preaches, teaching the word so that they can hear. They hear, they believe, and then they call on him. They call on the, one, the Lord. And so we see this process again as Paul writes it. He kind of goes backwards with it. But we see here how that he lays out what it is that we must in fact do. And this is the process. Not some miraculous thing. The Spirit doesn't lead us miraculously to salvation. He doesn't come down and, and, and touch my heart and, and therefore save me. And oh by the way, someday, just think about that brothers and sisters. What have we made God into when we argue that he has to miraculously touch our hearts for us to be saved? Some kind of miraculous gift. Well, if he doesn't miraculously touch my heart and make me where I can be saved, then he is a respecter of persons. The Bible says he's not a respecter of persons, by the way. And someday, ultimately, if I am lost, guess whose fault it has to be? It has to be God's fault, the Spirit's fault, because he didn't save me. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand he leads us to salvation through his written word. We have the written word that guides us to salvation. We go further. We ask the question, how does he in fact, and, and we see in these various texts, how he, 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 he leads us to salvation, but how does he lead us in our daily walk? As Christians, I look about and, and as far as I know, each of us here today are, are Christians. And perhaps there are those who will watch uh, on the, the internet and some may be may not be Christians. And they, they need to understand how they are led to salvation and hopefully they've gotten an idea of that. Maybe they have questions and they want to know. We, we of course, would be glad to help them know more. We'd be glad to discuss it further with them. 
Or maybe they're Christians, they're members of the body, and, and they, they want to know, they say, well, I've got that part down, and I want to know how does He lead me in my daily walk? How does He lead me as I live? And they give. Some in the religious world argue miraculously. Just turn on the television sometime and watch these so-called preachers, uh, denominational preachers, and it's amazing. I often say it and, and sort of... Uh, ridiculing them to an extent. It's really sad that they believe this, this false teaching, but or assuming they do believe it. Many people believe them, at least. That they get on there and they start talking about how the Holy Spirit is telling them about this or telling them about that. Telling them that there's somebody out there, and I, I've often, again, used this, there's somebody out there that has a headache, and, and the Holy Spirit is telling me you have a headache, and, 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 and He's acting upon you, and he's, he's getting rid of that. He's getting rid of that headache. Um, what's the chance somebody watching has a headache? But now, prove that nobody watching does have a headache. That's an impossibility. He has set up a situation where he cannot be proven wrong because you can't say there's not somebody out there that has the holy that, that has a headache. At least that part you can't be proven wrong. Now, as far as whether the Holy Spirit's talking to him, he can be proven wrong because the Bible teaches that he's wrong. And we, we recognize that, brothers and sisters, and we need to understand that it is not through some miraculous ability. And there are even those within the, the church who have fallen into that trap. I, I've, I've told you before, of course, whenever I was there at, at uh, Brown Trail, whenever I was in preaching school, of course, Rick, Rick actually there at uh, North Richmond Hills, uh, the hills as they call it now, uh, they, uh, he, he said uh, they, they implemented the Saturday evening service while I was there. This has been, of course, more than a decade ago, obviously. And, and they implemented a Saturday evening service and the Lord's Supper and, uh, at that time. And, of course, mechanical instruments. They, they added that to the worship service. And, and Mr. Atchley stood there, and if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but he stood there and I, I saw it. I saw the sermon where, where he stood there and he spoke of the Holy Spirit. Ten years earlier, brothers and sisters, I believe is what he said, had stood there, uh, had come to him while he was standing there on that very pulpit, and, and behind that very pulpit, on that very stage, that had told him that he was wrong in teaching that it was wrong to use mechanical instruments, and he needed a change. It took him all those years to figure out to do what the Holy Spirit told him. Brothers and sisters, if the Holy Spirit comes to me today and tells me I'm wrong on something, you better believe I'm going to stop mid-sentence and I'm going to correct my actions. I'm going to set myself straight. I'm not going to wait ten years and try to work behind the scenes and convince enough people to go along with me to where I can get what I really want and what I wanted all along. And that's, by the way, what he was really getting at. He just convinced himself that it was the Holy Spirit guiding him, or, or was using that to convince others. But brothers and sisters, there are those who argue that it is miraculous like that. But the Bible, on the other hand, doesn't teach that either. It, it refutes that, just as it does in relation to salvation. How does the Bible teach us, in fact, that we are taught, that we are guided, that we are led by the Spirit. First, or excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Holy Spirit is involved there, by the way. And God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, stop there for a minute. He provides us the scripture, it is inspired of God, it is written for us, that provides us those things that are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And notice the next verse, verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished or completely furnished, 
unto all good works. He guides us through His written Word unto all good works, the things we need to know. He tells us what we are to do and how to do it. Now, again, we understand that there are, there are some things. He says, okay, here's what I want. And He leaves, leaves it up to us, the exact process we carry things out. He says we are to assemble ourselves together upon the first day of the week. He doesn't say it has to be at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock or, or 9.45 as we meet here for Bible class. He, he, he doesn't tell us what time. He just says upon the first day of the week. He leaves that up to us about when. He tells us that there are certain acts of worship, if you will, that we are to to do. We, of course, we sing, we partake of the Lord's Supper, we, we give as we've been prospered, we pray and we, we, we have a lesson where we teach and, and are taught and, and learn, and, and these are all aspects of what we are here to do. We teach and admonish one another. He tells us all those things. He doesn't say, well, it has to be two songs and a prayer, a couple of more songs in the Lord's Supper. He doesn't tell us an exact order that we have to do it in. He leaves that up to a little common sense and, and a little uh, you know, free, free will, if you will. But he does teach us what we need to know. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. We know, of course, Peter teaches us that he has given us everything we need according as his divine power hath given to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. We have everything we need. Notice verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The Holy Spirit is leading us through His Word. We need to understand that. There are those who say, well, He's leading us through some miraculous abilities. The Bible doesn't say that He's doing that doesn't teach us that he any longer does that. It says he, he, he leads us through his word. Well, he, he saves us through miraculous, as we, we mentioned a few minutes ago. He saves us miraculously by acting upon us. Nowhere in scriptures will you find any individual who was miraculously acted upon to bring them to salvation. You can't find even one. They can't even go, as, as many denominationalists do, to try to refute baptism. They can't even go to the, 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 the thief on the cross. Because we read nowhere where he was acted upon by the Holy Spirit or by anyone to get him to turn to the truth. You can't find even one to say that, that, uh, that teaches that. They were all taught the Word of God. They were taught what they needed to know. We see there, someone may add, well, the word was the thief on the cross taught. Well, first of all, you don't know what he was taught whenever he, before he got on that cross. And second of all, and he, he could see very easily there's something different here. There's something going on here that isn't normal. You know, this was, this was a, I, I don't know, I mean, I say it was a routine process that, that they carried out where they crucified people. This man was crucified. Jesus was crucified and, and was beaten into a, to a point, scourged to a point where they could not even physically, he did not look physically himself. And yet look and read how he reacted, shall we say, how he carried himself hanging on that cross. We read a few moments ago there in, in Matthew 27 how they, they gave him vinegar mixed with gall they gave him something that was meant to deaden the pain, to kind of make him, put him in a stupor where he would die quicker and it would be less painful. They were showing him mercy. He wouldn't partake of that because he was not going to allow them to do that to him. He was going to be fully within his mind, fully experience what he was doing. Brothers and sisters, how does the Holy Spirit guide us, lead us today? He does it through His written Word. He does it through preaching. He does it through, through this process of, of, of the Word of God, not through some miraculous ability. So I, I conclude this morning the same way we began. The Holy Spirit leads us. But He leads us through His Word. 
He leads, he leads us through this. And he doesn't somehow miraculously, I, I want to add this, he doesn't somehow miraculously help me to understand his word. He, he doesn't come to me and say, by the way, Robert, here's exactly what it means. And, and because if he's doing that with me, he has to do it with everybody. And if he's doing it with everybody, why is so many different people coming up with so many different ideas? He's certainly not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14 teaches us that. He teaches us, brothers and sisters, by his written word. And, and we need to understand that. And he teaches us as as we understand what we must do in order to be saved. Now, I don't see anybody here, but for the sake of anybody that might watch, I don't see anybody here that, that needs to obey the gospel, but for the sake of those who perhaps watch via the internet, we need to understand that if we are outside of Christ, we are lost. We are without hope. But we can have that hope. We can be saved. And of course, again, we welcome all, whether here or, the, or watching via the internet, to, to obey the gospel. The Bible says we must hear the word. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repent of one's sins. Confess Him to be the Son of God and be baptized, immersed in water for the remission of sin. If you're here today and need to obey the gospel, we would encourage you to do so. Or if someone's watching and they're nearby, we'd be glad to help them obey the gospel. Or if they're, if they're far away and they need to, to know who can they contact, we'll be glad to help them. I'll tell you what, I'd be glad to put somebody, anybody anywhere in contact with someone that could help them obey the gospel. Or maybe there's someone here today who hasn't been the Christian he or she needs to be. You've allowed sin to get to, to enter your life and to lead you astray. You've, you've chosen the wrong path. You've drifted away from, from the Lord. The Lord promises if we're Christians that if we're faithful to confess our faults, He's faithful to forgive us. A wonderful thing to know, brothers and sisters, that He gives us another chance. <clears throat> if you're here and you have need, we encourage you, plead with you, come while we stand here and while we sing. Living below.